Solomon was about one years old at the time. We were living in the rectory of the church in Nanaimo. Alicia and I were sitting around one day having a discussion, and we were talking about our finances, about the ins and outs of our bills and, and the financial picture that we were working towards. Without realizing it, the conversation about money and about bills uh, morphed into a discussion about what was most important in our lives. It became a discussion about what we wanted to provide for Solomon and what type of community we wanted to live within. That conversation, uh, that conversation about what was most important to us and where we felt God was leading us, directly resulted in the move to Calgary two years later. It may be tempting to look at our reading from the gospel this morning and think that it's simply about the matter of paying bills, simply about finances. This is about the first century tax law. But just like in a regular life, a topic of money can open doors to discussions about what is most important in our lives. And this is what we see in our gospel. This is what Jesus leads the congregation before him to. The question about how giving to Caesar and whether that's important or not, is but an entrance into a deeper question about one's life with God. It leads into a question about how important we see God's place in our lives. So, relax, this is not a stewardship sermon, but you may find it as equally challenging. I invite you to pick up your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 22. It's roughly around page 25 in your pew Bibles. Now, often when you look at a Bible, they will have uh, subject headings printed above certain passages. And the heading given to this reading, and it's in our bulletin as well, uh, is paying taxes to Caesar. But this really isn't the question. This is kind of a misnomer because the question that is posed really isn't about that at all. The reading begins at verse 15, and we hear about the Pharisees and how they were joined by the Herodians wanting to trap Jesus in his words. Right? This is a setup. So you have the Pharisees on one side, and you also have the Herodians. The Herodians were people of Herod. They were the people who supported Rome's figurehead in Israel. And together they pose this question, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now again, just you know, just image this. They're posing a question about paying taxes to Caesar right in front of the people who support paying taxes to Caesar. Now, in the first century, this is a loaded question. Either way that Jesus answered, it would get him into trouble. Israel, at this point, they were under heavy taxation, as, as all Roman colonies were. The taxes that were paid to Rome were paid to support Rome and their military ventures, one of those being an occupation of Israel. There's an estimation that the Jewish people of the day roughly paid 49% of their annual income in taxation, both to Rome and also temple tax. The taxes to Caesar became a symbol of Roman authority and Roman oppression over Israel. So for Jesus to answer, well, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, that would be tantamount to saying that he agreed with Rome's occupation of Israel. That he himself saw himself as a subject of Rome. But there's more. Later, Jesus um, has the people pull out a coin and he asks whose inscription is on this. And they reply, Caesar. The actual inscription is Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, great high priest. There's a worshipful element in this. To say that Israel should pay taxes to Caesar, it could be construed as saying that Israel needed to worship Caesar as Lord. Caesar was the great high priest. He was the son of the divine. After all, the creed of the Romans was Caesar is Lord. So there was a sense of worship in this. So asking, do you pay taxes to Caesar, is also saying, will you worship Caesar? But what if he said no? What if he denied Caesar's right to receive anything from Israel? Well, he could be charged as a zealot. 
His ministry could be seen as leading a rebellion against Rome. He would be charged for treason and insurrection. So the question of taxes isn't really about taxes whatsoever. The question really was, who do you align with? Who do you follow? Who do you give yourself to? And this is the heart of Jesus' response. He sidesteps the entire matter. And he points to the deeper issue. Verse 21, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. And the point of that isn't to scratch your head and think, gosh, what, do I, what belongs to Caesar? No, the point is to ask yourself, what am I giving to God? How am I living my faithfulness? How am I living my life uh, to the God that I worship and the God that I belong to? See, this is why Jesus calls the people before him uh, in this passage. He calls them hypocrites with evil intent because they appear to be more interested in the right answer in regard to taxation rather than how to rightly live their lives before God. You know, it's sad, but in our day, sometimes we can be so consumed with finding a correct theological answer to a question that we forget about the call to live our lives faithfully. Who do you, what do you give to God? How do you give of yourself? How do you give your life to Jesus? How does the presence and the activity of the Spirit define who you are? who you see yourself to be, how you live within this world. Now, it can be easy to offer simple answers. After all, we're all sitting in church. And so it might be tempted to say, well, this isn't a problem for me. Right? I'm a faithful person. I go to church. I try to be nice. I try to be a good person. I try to help out whenever I can. But that's where that internal look stops. But notice that part of the group that come to Jesus are the Pharisees. These are the religious people of the day, the religious professionals, right? And, and so, too, they could point to their lives around the temple and say, well, we know what it means to be a good person, to live the faithful life. But Jesus calls them to more. Just as there is an image imprinted upon a coin declaring the coin is offered for certain purposes, so too our lives bears a certain image. This goes right back to Genesis. We bear the image of God, and so it calls us to recognize that our life is to be offered for certain purpose. The reality of who you are, in your inmost being, it spills over to the other areas of your life as you become this constant witness to the connection that you have with the Lord. How do you give your life to God? Practically, as you embody that in your life. It's a challenging question. It was challenging uh, when the questioners heard this. It was so challenging that they were amazed when they left him. They just had nothing to say. You give to God what is God's. The Spirit calls us to look deep in our lives. So trace your life during the week, Monday through Friday. What does it mean to give your life to God? How does Jesus show up in your life? How is your life a constant expression of faith? An unending witness to the fact that you are a follower of Jesus. Go through your week and ask, what activities do I engage in? What activities do I not engage in because of my faith? For example, do you pray during the week? One of the ways that we give to God what is God is finding time to present ourselves to God in prayer. Right? We bring our petitions. We bring our hurts, our anxieties. We bring our joy. We bring our requests. And if we go a week or if we go uh, two weeks without this prayerful connection, then I think we need to ask ourselves, well, are we giving to God what is God's? How do you actively give yourself 
to God, to the work of God in this world. Again, thinking about the coin, it's used for certain purposes. In some way, that coin is given for that work. Well, if you bear the image of God, then how do you give yourself to God's work in this world? How do you participate in the future that God is wishing to bring about around you? Or within you? Or in this place? As you know, we just got back from a wedding last week, and it was a wonderful time. It was a fabulous celebration for the family. One of my favorite parts of the wedding liturgy is when the entire congregation stands. I ask everybody to stand, and I, and I ask them, will you do all in your power to support and uphold this marriage? It's very reminiscent of the baptismal liturgy, where again I invite everybody to stand, and I ask, will you do all in your power to support this person in their life in Christ. And if you were here during a baptism, you may remember that I always introduce that question by reminding the people that they are not just passive observers of the rite. Right? You're not just passive observers of the, the baptism or the marriage. They are, they are active participants in what's going on. One of the biggest dangers we have in our spiritual lives is believing that we can be passive in our faith. That all we need to do is just, uh, just sit and consume the, the religious stuff around us, and this makes it fine. Just assume that our relationship with God doesn't call us to any activity, any investment of life, or any participation. And that leads to stagnated Christians. People who might who might be able to say the right things, but don't live the right life. Jesus constantly teaches the opposite. To be a follower of Jesus is to live your life actively. To live your faith actively. It is to join with God in what God is doing in this world. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church, we read this in our second reading, he praised God for the Thessalonians' work produced by faith, Labor prompted by love and endurance inspired by hope in Jesus. There was a sense of activity, of livelihood that people could see, that the people around them could touch and hear. And that activity of the Thessalonian church, it became a witness. It became um, a sign of their faith in God. And it became known everywhere, Paul says. The message of the gospel comes not with words, but with power and the Holy Spirit, which affects people's lives. And so too, the giving of our life to God, the living out of our faith, cannot simply be a matter of words alone. It has to come with power, with a power of the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. It changes our lives. It defines our life. It calls for our participation. Where is Jesus calling you to give him what is his? To give to God what is God's? Where is the place that Jesus is pointing you towards? A role, a ministry, an action. Something that you are drawn to participate in. To be active around. It doesn't have to be a structure here at the church, but it could be doesn't have to be something new. Maybe it's maybe Jesus is calling you just to continue in some activity that you are in. Maybe there is a new thing that God is calling you towards. Maybe it's something about your work week, a fellowship you can cultivate, a time of prayer that you can hold, a support that you can offer. What we participate in, in the life that we cultivate, inherently declares what we find important. It declares our allegiance. It declares who we follow. It declares what we give ourselves to. So let's heed the challenge and the call of our Lord and our Savior. And give to God that which is God's in our lives. And embody that offering as we faithfully live within this world. Amen.